I've reviewed most of the popular broadcast and podcast mics from Electrovoice and a couple from Rode, and I've enjoyed them quite a bit. Now I can finally take on the legendary Shure SM7B. This bad boy was made and designed for vocal studios, performs very well in such environments, and looks pretty slick. Let's take a look right after this. You may proceed. I'm Meeples Vox, here to make tech easier and more fun, and today we're taking a look at the Shure SM7B. This is actually on loan from Mike over at uh, Booth Junkies, which is a really cool YouTube channel dedicated to home studio voiceover tips and reviewing microphones like myself and other audio hardware, so go check him out. He's got some really good stuff. This is a $400 vocal dynamic cardioid microphone and is responsible for the popular podcast sound you might associate with quality podcasts. While the Electrovoice RE20 and RE27ND tend to exemplify the radio sound, the SM7B has more of a podcast sound. You're listening to Epos Vox in the morning. This thing is big, but I don't think it's as heavy as the RE20. It's solid black and has an XLR extension, foam windscreen, and an arm mount all integrated into the mic. They offer two thicknesses of windscreens for you to use, depending on how close your speaker is, but in most cases you'll want to be right up on this mic. Compared to the expensive mount for Electrovoice's mics, the better nuts replacements for their awful threading that they give you on the default mount, this, all, this whole package feels quite premium. The XLR cable seems to bend at exactly the same point as the actual like adjustment screws here that screw into the side of the mic, uh, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable as that cable would be hard to replace or fix, but it also seems like it's intentional, so I don't know, just don't yank on it too hard, I guess. The back of the capsule here has two switches, a bass roll-off switch that starts around the 300 hertz range, and a presence boost switch, which opens up the 1 to 10 kilohertz range. These switches can be adjusted by a small flathead screwdriver or the tip of a pin. You can't really do it with your fingers, which is a mild annoy annoyance, but that prevents them from being hit uh, on accident, which is kind of an important thing. One of the big selling points of this microphone is its dynamic range. This mic can handle really low voices, which I can't, I'm, allergies are kicking my butt, so I can't even go all that low right now, but they can also handle some of the loudest sounds you'll throw at it in a normal studio environment. A specialty focus of this mic is that it holds up very well to filter out uh, computer fans, electrical hum and hiss, the, you know, those kinds of, ow, I hit a box, those kinds of rumbles and hisses and stuff you might encounter in a home studio or in a production studio with a lot of equipment. And I have to say that I have found this to be the case even in my setup, and it's making me consider switching from the RE20 to the SM7B. I don't think I'm going to do it, but the fact that there is virtually no noise floor here compared to my RE20, even with my servers going and my computer going and everything, is very impressive. This makes this the perfect microphone choice for uh, uh, untreated, not untreated, but not fully tre sound treated environments for recording where you just truly need the background noise gone, which is especially good for podcasters. Now, there's a huge issue that you might run into with the Shure SM7B. It requires a lot of gain. This is a passive dynamic microphone. It doesn't take phantom power, but it requires some great preamps or a combination of your mixer or interface's preamps with an external one, like the Cloudlifter CL1 or the Triton Fedhead. My dedicated Nady preamp just couldn't do the job clean enough, but my DBX286S, which also powers the RE20 on its own, seems to handle it just fine. Here's a quick sample with only slightly adjusted settings from what I normally use on the RE20, just because I don't have the time to fine-tune it and then figure out my RE20 settings again. Alright, this is a microphone audio test hooked up the Shure SM7B to my DBX286S, a channel strip processing rack thing that I have running. I have slightly tweaked my knobs from what my RE20 was set at previously, but I think my RE20 was set incorrectly, so I'm going to try it next with these settings anyway. So I've got the HF or high frequency detail boosted up to 7.5 and, and the low frequency detail boosted up to 4. If we crank that up a little bit, I think we'll get a little bit more boomy, but it'll start sounding more muddy again. So I'm going to turn that back down to 4. Uh, we could turn down the high frequency detail, but again, I think it heads back to that muddy range. So 7.5 and, and 4, and everything else is the same. I'll have pictures up on screen, but this is what it sounds like, and it's totally amplified just fine. I didn't need to apply any extra gain or crazy thing like that, and there still seems to be way less noise floor 
than my RE20. I've also found that my Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 audio recorder actually has good enough preamps to record the SM7B and power it fully, and it's only up to about the one o'clock range, uh, you know, one, one o'clock on the dial, which is very impressive. I, I am quite surprised. It only needs a little bit more amplification than like some of my shotgun microphones I've been using. All of this video has been recorded with the Mix, Sound Devices Mix Pre 3, by the way. That quietness of the microphone contributes to its ability to reject room and background noise, but that pretty much always guarantees that the speaker will have to be right on top of the microphone. It will be blocking your face to a degree, and you won't be able to talk off axis much. Let me try this now. So this is straight on with the microphone. I backed up a couple, um, like a few inches away from it. Straight on with the microphone. Now, if I come over here to the side, I immediately start to drop off. If I come over here to the side, I immediately start to drop off back up front, back around side. So if you're doing like a live stream and you're normally talking right up on this, hey guys, how's it going? I'm Epos Vox. And then you start having to lean over for something or take a look at your screen and start talking to your viewers. Some, some, sometimes they might not hear you. They got really quiet. With the switches set to completely flat, much like the RE20, it sounds a little bit muddier and just not as clear or good out of the box. If you plan on running it through audio processing hardware or a VST chain or something, it's kind of how you want it. But just for the mic being recorded on its own like I'm doing now, you may want to engage the presence boost switch. Having the presence boost on and the bass roll off off <laughs> results in a very boomy and podcasty sound, which is great. Really brings the speaker up front and demands attention. With the roll-off switch on, that can still happen, but you do lose some of the boominess. That would be preferred for more live performances and such. However, I am now going to switch. I currently have, uh, for most of this video, I've had the present switch on and the bass roll-off off. But we're going to switch that to where the bass roll-off is on and the present boost is on as well. And then I'll kick off the presence boost too. All right, so now this is the microphone with the presence boost on and the bass roll off on. You can probably tell I no longer have quite as boomy of a voice going into the microphone. Even if I get up here on the proximity effect, not so much. It sounds a little thinner, a little like it still has that, you know, punch to it, but you don't have any of the boom or rumble uh, that is, is sometimes more commonly associated with uh, uh, radio, basically. All right, now I'm going to switch the present switch off as well. All right, now both switches are off. This is microphone is set to completely flat. This is just the plain sound that you can get out of it. This is a microphone test. My name is Epos Vox. You're listening to WVOX. Doesn't sound quite the same. Let me hit that presence boost again. You're listening to WVOX Vox Radio. If nothing else, I can tell by the audio levels that it sounds a little bit more <laughs> punchy there. And also what I mentioned before is that it, I, I won't say suffers from the proximity effect because I believe that's intentional, but the closer to the mic you get, and we're talking about within different amounts of centimeters and just basically kissing on it, the warmer and boomier your recording comes. Back away from it and you... Still, it can be picked up, and you still can get levels out of it, but you don't sound anywhere near as boomy. But if you get right up on here, you sound pretty nice. Get right up on it and advertise your local classic rock station. It's a pretty good mic, but unless you're doing live performances where you can crank the levels anyway, I feel like it has some pretty specific use cases that not everyone might appreciate. It is certainly on my recommended list now. I... I... I want one for myself, especially, like I said, about the noise floor, especially how much how, how better of a job it does re, uh, rejecting background noise. That's pretty crazy. I guess next I need to tackle the high LPR40, huh? If you like this video, hit the like button, subscribe for more, consider checking out Booth Junkie's channel for more voiceover tips and mic reviews as well. I'm Eples Fox, and I'll see you next time. Eples Vox is a Patreon-supported production. Our videos would simply not be possible without the support and generosity of our patrons.